Blue, Blue Hall at Games Gathering in Bratislava. Uh, please welcome Kate, who will uh, uh, lead us and learn, let us learn about culturalization uh, and how values affect, affect it. So please put your hands together for Kate. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. And um, thank you for coming to the talk. And uh, hopefully this will be enlightening and useful. I know the title, I, as I was reflecting on the title, I think some people may not understand exactly what I'm talking about, but you will. So to give you more context, so I'm a geographer. I've been working in the game industry for almost 29 years doing what I call culturalization work. So I've worked on a lot of titles you've probably heard of like Halo and Fable and Age of Empires and Call of Duty and Tomb Raider and a lot of stuff like that. And my job essentially is to help developers make sure that the content that they're releasing into different markets around the world is actually going to be compatible with the political situation, the cultural situation and so on. And so I've been doing this for a very long time, but in addition to that, I've done other work in the industry, like run the International Game Developers Association and run the Global Game Jam as well. And um, so I've been doing a lot of stuff in this industry. So basically, if you were to summarize essentially what I've been doing for almost 29 years is exploring this interaction between what is real, so the situation on the ground out there in the world, what is represented in our games, and then how is that representation perceived by people of different cultures and different backgrounds. And it's a very interesting interaction, uh, which of course has been made even more interesting with social media and the way that we share information or disinformation today. Um, of course, I don't need to talk about this. We all know what's going on uh, not too far away. What The reason I bring this up, though, is because it's a prime example of how this, there's this intersection between what's happening in the world and how it's reflected in our game content. Because after that event happened back in February, a lot of my clients that I work with regularly ha were scrambling to figure out what are we supposed to do now? Why, what do we do about content, you know, both Russian and Ukrainian content in our games? Games. And so there are a lot of a lot of companies where they did not have a policy, they did not have a a, a stance or a position basically on this. Um, so they had to figure out what is their position. And you know, fortunately, pretty much universally, the game industry responded in favor of Ukraine and took actions to change content in their games, um, and as well as the boycott sales in Russia and things like that, um, both Russia and Belarus actually. Um, so there was this huge, you know, response from the industry, but it really caught a lot of game companies off guard. They were just like, we don't know how to respond to this in much the same way when the Black Lives Matter movement was occurring two years ago in response to George Floyd's murder in the U.S. A lot of companies were then also caught off guard. They were not sure what they were supposed to do in response. Um, and yeah, this was just uh, last week. This happened on Roblox. Um, but it's not just Ukraine and Russia, obviously. There's a lot of conflicts going on around the world. Um, that's the one that we, a lot, a lot of us are paying attention to. But of course, you know, on the other side of the world in Taiwan, we have a lot of heightened tensions of what's going on with Taiwan and China. That's been an issue for decades, but it's getting more and more heated um, practically with every month. And so there's more concerns now about how we represent Taiwan, how we treat China, what are we going to do as game developers in terms of releasing our content into China or not. And so that's this, that's what I'm going to be talking about today because all of this fits under that action of culturalizing your content and making your content available to different markets. Now, one of the reasons this is really important, other than just, you know, trying to get sales, is because, you know, a lot of game developers I speak with, when I travel a lot, I, I'm fortunate enough to travel to a lot of places around the world, especially a lot of emerging markets. And when I talk to developers in those markets and I ask them, where, what's your goal for your game? Where do you want your game to go? And most all of them say, we want it to go to North America and Western Europe, because that's where all the money is and the attention. That's not really true. You might get more attention, but that's not where the money is. Because if you look at these year-over-year -year growth rates for gamers across these different regions, I mean, look at the Middle East and Africa, you know, over 8% year-over-year growth. That's very significant, especially uh, given the current economic conditions. And so Latin America as well is almost 5%. Asia Pacific is still going pretty strong. But then you look at North America and Western Europe, and it's, or, you know, generally Europe and um 
it's not that high. And that's because these are somewhat saturated markets for games. They're still viable markets, of course. But my point being is that a lot of developers, they keep focusing on the West as being where they want to release their games. And yet a lot of the opportunity for revenue is not in the West. It's elsewhere in the world. But they don't design their games for those other markets. They're not thinking about how somebody in Nigeria is going to care about their content or someone in Vietnam. They're thinking, well, how would an American like this? Would someone in the UK like this or someone in Germany? Um, so it's basically a pushing to expand our horizon, thinking about who's going to see our game? Who do we want to see our game? And I think most developers that I talk to, when you ask them, who would you like to have play your game? It's everybody, <laughs> not just play my game. I want everyone to buy my game. That's more important. Um, and so that's why we have to keep that focus and kind of think beyond our typical target. Um, and that's where culturalization comes into play. So what culturalization essentially is, is, is I work with people like you who create these amazing game worlds, and I try and help figure out how is that game world and the content going to be compatible with the local worldviews of these different markets. And so it's this exercise where it's, I kind of see it as like gene splicing, where you're trying to combine two different things and arrive at content that's going to work in these different markets. And so I work in this zone where I'm looking at content assets in the game, like audio, character design, environment design, the narrative, everything in the game to, just, to figure out, is that content going to be compatible or incompatible with the local market and the expectations in that local market? Those expectations are sometimes based on actual laws around content, what you can and cannot do. And other times it's based just on general values in that market about things people wanna see or don't wanna see. Um, but anytime we make a decision, like for example, if I'm looking at a character design in a game, and maybe the character is using you know, clothing from a particular culture or time in history, there's many different things we have to think about on how we want to change that or not. So the first thing we, we always think about is the high-level value, company values and goals. And I, you can replace company with developer because this is also your values, what you're willing to stand for or not stand for um, as a creator. The other thing is the context in which the content is generated. What I mean by this is that all of us are biased because we are all from a specific place, a specific time, a specific language, and we tend to overcome our bias with education. That's why we go to school, because we learn about other things out there in the world and try and overcome that bias. But a lot of times in the creative process, that bias will creep in because it's a subconscious thing. Um, and I'll come back to that later. Also the business strategy for the vertical. So if you're a big company like Sony or Microsoft, you have to think about if I make this one change in this game, how is it going to affect our other businesses that are not game related? So like Microsoft and Sony make a lot of products that are not games. So they have to think about how that's going to position against their other businesses. Um, market strategy for the locale, because how we approach sales or re approach releasing games in China is very different from releasing games in Saudi Arabia, for example, which is very different from releasing games in Brazil. Also the strategy for a specific game, because the different game types have a different response uh, across different markets. So like World of Warcraft, real-time strategy games, real -time, uh, the RTS games are quite different from how they might be perceived like a FPS or RPG in the different markets. And then finally, there's the, the changing geopolitical, uh, cultural, and social factors because as we've learned over the last two years alone with COVID is that the world is an extremely dynamic place and perceptions change, disinformation is out there. And we have to be very careful about how we release things. So I'm looking also when the game is, when is the game coming out and what are the market conditions in that, in that place uh, when the game is coming out? So I'll give you a few examples that are really easy ones. So part of my background is cartography. So I was a map maker. And so I deal with a lot of mapping issues in my consulting work that have nothing to do with games. But it was interesting that like Apple, when, the, uh, when Russia b basically stole Crimea back in 2014, Apple immediately changed their maps to show that Crimea was now part of Russian territory. But they were doing that only in the Russian domain. 
But then now recently this year, when Russia took its aggression against Ukraine, they reversed that decision because now they decided to show the, in, show the map in favor of Ukraine. So it's very interesting that when they were under pressure, um, when they were not under pressure, when Crimea was, was stolen, they just decided to make the change because cartography is often about representing ground truth. What is actually happening on the ground? Who controls the territory on the ground? Whereas now they decided to make a different decision where even though Russia still technically controls Crimea, they decided to reverse the perception on the map. And of course they got criticism for that because they flip-flopped on their decision. This kind of stuff happens all the time, though, because maps are an absolute battleground for mindshare. They are a battleground for perception, a battleground for worldviews. We've seen things like Pakistan. Uh, they showed part of uh, disputed territory as part of their map. Um, Western Sahara, for example, is Morocco requires Western Sahara to be shown as Moroccan territory. You cannot show it as a separate entity. Uh, Ethiopia, quote, accidentally showed all of Somalia as part of its territory. Um, there's nothing accidental about that. That's a long-standing dispute between the two. Um, and these things go on and on. Even not outside of the context of an actual map, like the Gap stores that sells clothing, they made these t-shirts with this design of China, but China got really upset and basically threatened the Gap stores because, if you look at this map closely, it's missing Taiwan and the South China Sea, which is claimed by China. And so because the, that was missing on the map, that's why China was basically threatening to shut down all Gap-related stores in China because of this one issue. Because China requires that their view of the world, where they own the South China Sea and Taiwan, must be shown at all times. Um, similarly, this movie, Abominable, when it came out a few years ago, this movie was about a, a little girl who helps a, a, a Yeti get back to its home in the Himalayas. There's one scene in this film that's like two seconds long. This is the shot right here. And you see the camera go panning past this map. And this map is showing that depiction of China's ownership, the South China Sea. Now, because of this, this is why the Philippines, Malaysia, and Vietnam said we are not releasing this film in our market. And the reason they're not releasing is because they're part of the dispute. This is a very complicated dispute in the South China Sea. And so those three countries said, you need to remove this shot from the film, two second shot. If you remove it, then we'll release the film. Well, normally a few years ago, because this is a DreamWorks film, normally DreamWorks would have instantly said, no problem, it's gone, we'll release the film. But this time they said, no, we're not taking it out. And the reason they're not taking it out is because this film was co-produced with a Chinese animation studio that basically used their leverage to say, no, the film must have this scene in here because it's required. And so that's why this film did not release in those three markets, just because of this, a two second scene in the film showing this map. And these kind of issues are increasing more and more um, as content, especially creative content like films and video games, become a battleground for these competing worldviews. Um, you know, we've seen this in a lot of films. You know, for example, Doctor Strange got a lot of pushback when the film came out because in the comic book, the main mentor character of Doctor Strange, the ancient one, is an old Chinese man. And so in the films, though, they replaced that character with Tilda Swinton as this Celtic, you know, ancient Celtic person, which I thought that was great. I loved her depiction, but that's not from the comic book. But the but they came out after the film was released. They the writers said the whole reason we did that because we didn't want to upset China, because that was their fear. They want the movie to release in China, so they basically made that canonical change to the comic book just to make sure China is happy. Um, and that's that's a problem that we're seeing more and more. You can see there's articles that have been written more and more recently about that dangerous influence where studios are allowing countries like China to have that influence over their creative content. You know, this the football player who had tweets about the Uyghur Muslims, he was basically erased from a game because China did not like what he was saying on social media. You know, and on and on these stories go. There's all kinds of 
you know, examples we've had in very recent years. I mean, this is an infamous one where Ubisoft came out and said, our games are not political. There are no politics in games. That is the most naive statement I've ever heard from a studio executive because, I mean, Ghost Recon, Far Cry 5, you know, these games are purely political. There's so much political content in them. Far Cry 5 is about an ultra-right religious group in Montana in the U.S. You can't get more political than that, especially in the U.S. right now. Um, so they're kind of living in this dream world thinking that their games are not political. But the reality is that all creative content, no matter if it's film, literature, television, games, we all are part of culture and culture can be politicized as we know. So, you know, and we're seeing this more and more in the game sector, especially I'm using China as a big example because they're an easy target because they've been more openly aggressive about changing their policies around what content is acceptable or not acceptable in their marketplace and where a lot of companies are starting to feel that influence and you have to ask yourself too and be a little concerned when you see companies like tencent having uh ownership or you know some minority ownership in a lot of major game companies today that ownership also reflects some degree of influence whether they you know whether they admit it or not um, and so what I'm really talking about here, what, I'm, what I've been noticing in my work is this digital battle for mindshare where all of these different governments, cultural institutions, and factions online, they're all competing for mindshare. Who basically gets to control that global and local cultural narrative? Who gets to write what is reality? And we've seen this over and over with the concerns over the last several years about disinformation, fake news, and all the problems we're seeing on social media. Um, and of course, that is the reason why some of these countries, like China, has the golden shield, as they call it, otherwise known as the Great Firewall of China. You know, Russia implemented their sovereign internet law a few years ago to block out external influence. Saudi Arabia has done it for years. North Korea has done it for years. And the end result of this, of course, is that you get a society that is completely blocked off and insular and not exposed to external ideas. And that, as we have seen, even in the Ukraine conflict, that leads to very dangerous results in terms of people's perception of what's happening. So to step back a little bit, just to talk about what I call ev evolving content versions. So back in the old days of software, we didn't, we didn't adapt content as much as we do today. In fact, in the very earliest days, when you created a game or created you know, anything, you basically had what I call the default version. So that's your pure creative vision. That's like a writer writing a book and just giving it out to the world. That is a default version of their, of their, uh, of their creative uh, expression. Um, so they don't do any localization, they don't do any culturalization, it's just like, here's my piece of art out for the world. Um, now, in the early days of software, what they did is what I call the localized version. So they would create that default version, and then they would do very minimal localization. So, for example, they would do what they, we called figs and J, French, Italian, German, Spanish, and Japanese, and that's it. They would do those five languages and say, hey, we're good for the whole world. But... Um, they don't do that much anymore. What we have today, a lot of software and a lot of games are what I would call a globalized version where they do a lot of localization. So a lot of games today, especially AAA games, will get translated into maybe 20 to 30 languages. And they do some level of culturalization, which means they go in and they change a few things in the actual game to make sure it's, the game content's going to work in different markets, like in the Middle East, for example. Um, and that's pretty typical of a lot of games today then some studios today are taking a further step where they're actually spending more effort and time making what I call a culturalized version. So they not only have a default version, the original game, but they do a ton of localization and they do a ton of culturalization because they want the game to feel like it was made locally. Um, and like it's truly an artifact of that culture. And I see this more in the mobile game space now because a lot of mobile games are more agile in their development. Um, I don't see this as much in AAA, especially because to do this to a AAA game, let's say for like the next Elder Scrolls game, it would be incredibly expensive and a lot take uh, far more time to do. Um, but Blizzard is a good example where a lot, a lot of the Blizzard games like Diablo and World of Warcraft, they do an incredible amount of culturalization of their games. 
Um, so here's an example, like I mentioned Western Sahara earlier. This is, a, this is an example of how you can culturalize a piece of content. So even with one issue like Western Sahara, this is four different ways that it can appear depending on who your audience is. So most of the world, oftentimes when you see a map, you'll see Western Sahara separated from Morocco, or you'll see it like this, where it's shown as a disputed territory, but Morocco will require that it be shown like this. They want the map like this. Um, because they claim all of Western Sahara, and it's a requirement. Just like Argentina still calls the Falkland Islands Islas Malvinas, which is the name they have for the Falkland Islands. Even though they lost the Falklands War 40 years ago, they still claim the Falkland Islands, and they still require that. And there's many, many requirements like that um, in different countries. And that's just, that's just maps. That's just one particular type of content. Like when, what, some of my work that I've done in the past, I worked with Google to help them perfect what we call domain tailoring so that when you go to it, different internet domains, the map will change depending on what domain that you're in because there's different regulations for how the map must appear. So for example, for Kashmir, which is the area in Northern India, which is highly disputed between India, Pakistan, and China, most of the world sees this version where you see these disputed lines dividing up the territory. But in India, you must show that territory as Indian by law. And if you don't show it that way, your, your product is banned. And even if you have like a really quick world map in your video game that just has like a little locator map that's up on the screen for five seconds and then you don't see it for the rest of the game, if that map does not show India like this, and you're selling it in India, they will ban the, the game because of that. Um, so they're very strict about these rules. China has very similar rules, like I mentioned before, and other countries do. And like I said, this is just one kind of content. This is only talking about maps, not a lot of the other things that we'll talk about. Um, so basically what I'm seeing is that that versioning, the different versions that I talked about, I've seen a war on versioning. And what I mean by that is in the past, the default versions were often accepted as a reality. So China, for example, they knew that we had a version for North America, a version for Europe, and a version for China. And they knew that the content was different between all of those. But now what we've seen over the past decade or so is that some countries like China are getting far more aggressive about what the default version can be. So now instead of saying, okay, it's fine if we have a US version and a Chinese version, now they're saying the Chinese version has to be the default version that the whole world sees. So basically we wanna see our map, we wanna see our content, um, and we want that to be the version that everybody sees. And if you don't do it that way, then there will be repercussions. So um, today there's this aggressive assault on what's allowed to be the default version. And it comes down to the key issue, which is what line will your company cross or not cross when you make these decisions in your game? And I'll give you some examples of things that have happened recently. So for example, in the Louvre in, in, in Paris, they were going to do an exhibit about Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan is a very controversial figure in China because he has, he, part of his background is from Western China with the Uyghur people, which China has been openly oppressing now for several years. And so they don't wanna see content about Genghis Khan. So the Louvre was going to put an exhibit about it. And this is halfway around the world in Paris. It has nothing to do with China, but China put pressure on the French government, economic pressure on the French government saying, don't do this. We do not want to see this exhibit in the Louvre. Just like the Marriott company, the hotel chain, they were showing in their list of destinations on their website, they had Taiwan and Tibet shown separately from China. And so China basically approached the Marriott chain and said, you need to show those as part of China, like, you know, under the list of China as destinations, or we're going to basically shut down Marriott hotels in China. Just like the three major US airlines a few years ago, they were also showing Taiwan as a separate location that you could fly to. They did not put it under China, but China put pressure on the three airlines and said, you have to show Taiwan as a destination inside China. And if you don't do that, we're going to restrict your ability to use our airports. So what do you think they did? They changed it instantly because they, they can't afford to lose those airport berths. And that's the kind of pressure China has been putting on content. We, we did, they were not doing that even five or 10 years ago, but now they're in a much more aggressive state. You may have heard about this example. 
And this is in, from uh, Top Gun in the original Top Gun movie. Maverick was wearing this jacket, which was his father's jacket. And you can see the jacket had the Japanese flag and the flag of Taiwan. The flag of Taiwan will get you instantly banned in China. You are not allowed to show the flag of Taiwan. So here we go. He has this jacket. And then in the sequel, when they had the previews back at the, you know, at the beginning of COVID, because the film was delayed for two years, in the original trailer for Top Gun Maverick, he, this is what the jacket looked like. There is no Japanese flag, and the Taiwan flag is completely gone, even though this is supposed to be the same jacket. And so it was obvious that they were changing the jacket for the sake of opening this film in China. And so they got so much backlash over this, is that when the film eventually did release earlier this year, they actually went back and changed it to this. And so they did not release this film in China at all. And it's been wildly successful, even outside of China's market. You know, China is the largest film market in the world, just like it's the largest game market. But the film has proven that you can be successful without selling your game in China or selling your film in China. So this, in a way, Top Gun, this example has kind of been a hero to a lot of other creative media saying, maybe you don't need to release in China because they prove that you know you can get, make a lot of money without it. Um, but it also proves the total hypocrisy and kind of expose what companies are willing to do in order to sell in China. Here's an example uh, from Age of Empires that I worked on where in the original historical scenario, you had the Japanese right here invading the Korean, Korean Peninsula, the Chozon Empire back in the Middle Ages, and they basically almost took over the Chozon Empire. So when we released this game into Korea, the Korean Ministry of, Ministry of Information banned the game because of this. And the reason they banned it is because it, they said this never happened. In their version of history, in Korean history, they said this did not happen. So we had to decide, if you remember that list of multiple things we need to think about, we had to decide at Microsoft, what are we going to do? At that time, we were trying to grow the games business. The Xbox did not exist yet, but we were trying to grow the games business on PC. And we also knew from market research that real-time strategy games like Age of Empires were wildly popular in Korea, which a year later is when StarCraft came out, which became this national phenomenon in Korea. So what we had to do is we essentially changed history through a patch only for Korean players. So instead, Japan invades, uh, or excuse me, Korea invades Japan rather than Japan invading Korea. Now, as you can imagine, this created a lot of debate on the team about the nature of ethics and truth. Is this the right thing to do? Should we do this kind of thing just to make sales in the market? And that's the whole point of what I'm talking about is that it comes down to your values. What are you willing to stand for or not stand for to, to actually get into a certain market? In this case, we felt it was justifiable because it was basically meeting local expectations in the same way we localize things, we change some facts um, every once in a while, like in the encyclopedias in Carta that I worked on, we had different heights from Mont Blanc, the mountain on the French-Italian border, because at the time the two countries did not agree on the exact height of the mountain, so we had to have different heights which in different versions of the encyclopedia. So this is, this is something that happens uh, quite a bit. Um, Mass Effect, when I worked on Mass Effect, we had the game banned um, because of this uh, lesbian relationship that was shown in the game, and they did not like that. That's, that's against the values of Singapore. Now, at the time, I was in Singapore, and I talked to the ratings board, and I asked them, you know, what, what happened here? Because your ratings don't say that this is something that you would ban. And they said, no, 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 we didn't ban it because of this. It had nothing to do with this. It's because our rating system is not ready yet. So we're basically not letting anything release, which was a bunch of bullshit because later they, you know, they banned the scene in, in Star Wars episode nine for the same reason. Um, you know, then recently China has decided to crack down on same-sex relationships in video games. They were very explicit about this last year, which for a lot of clients that I work with, that was a deal breaker because so many clients are trying to do the opposite. They're trying to be more inclusive of, of people who play their games, including people in the LGBTQIA community. And so they're trying to make their games more adaptable and, and more representative of people from those communities. And China is coming out saying, we don't want to see that in games. And so that is now one of the requirements in China is you can't show those kind of relationships in games. So a lot of companies I work with, they felt that was crossing a line. That announcement by China crossed the line of values for the company where they're trying to be inclusive and China is basically wanting them to not be 
inclusive. So um, this incident that happened with Hearthstone when they had the Hearthstone tournament that Blizzard ran um, was pretty interesting to me because you had the winner of the tournament who's based in Taiwan posting pro Hong Kong statements because this is back during the protest in Hong Kong a few years ago. And so they basically sh shut down his speech. They took away his prize. And then there was a lot of backlash over their response. But what was clear to me from this whole incident is that Blizzard was completely caught off guard. They had no clue how to respond to this. And what's interesting though is that the CEO of Blizzard was saying that this has nothing to do with China. That is ridiculous. I mean, not only does it have something to do with China, because otherwise, why would you shut down his speech over Hong Kong? Um, the fact that Blizzard is partially owned by Tencent has something to say about this. You know, there, again, there is a, that, that issue of influence that comes from having ownership or partial ownership over companies. The more ridiculous thing when we're talking about values is that at the Blizzard campus, both on their website and at this statue that's in the middle of the campus when you visit, all of these values of the company are put right there in brass on the ground around this statue. And these two in particular, Every Voice Matters and Thinking Globally, basically they pissed all over their own values by taking that action in the Hearthstone tournament. And they got open criticism from their own employees. There were Blizzard employees leaving notes at the base of that statue, criticizing their own company, saying you basically failed um, here. So what we're talking about here is about the nature of content and that all content, all game content carries culture with it. Not only the culture of where it was developed, whether it's here, or you know wherever it is, and it's also the culture of your company and of your organization. Um, you know, some some companies in our industry they don't care if they're known to be kind of edgy and offensive. Rockstar has made a career out of this, but they don't care. That's that's who they have chosen to portray themselves to be. Whereas a company like Microsoft is far more conservative. They do not want to be seen that way. Um, so we have to think about the critical decision making that's going on and and how the the decisions about specific creative decisions in the game are connected to the values that you have as a creator and as a company. And th so you think about the values that define those boundaries of creative decisions. Like, will you change this character for China or not? Will you change this game to go into Saudi Arabia or not? Um, and so it, we have this constant interaction between these three areas of the business goals that we have, which tend to be focused on maximizing our revenue, and then the, the creative goals, which is maximizing our self-expression and, and making a great game, and then also our values that dictate how we do those other things. Um, and ultimately, the values that we have define how we want the world to perceive our company or who we are as creators. And then the policies we create define how those values get integrated and how they influence the creative process. So when you're actually make, making a character or writing the narrative or something like that, how do, how do the values of your organization filter into that decision? Um, and it's something that a lot of companies, frankly, they don't, it's not at the forefront of their thinking because if you go in, if you're an artist, for example, you go into work, what are you doing? You're just making art. You're doing your job. You're doing a great job creating something. And a lot of times the values aren't hanging over your head, but there does need to be a way for those values to be reinforced or somebody in the process needs to step back and say, is this representative of who we are? Is this the kind of game that we want to release? So, you know, our choices, our creative choices reflect our values. So a single choice can set a precedent about the perception of who we are as creators for a long time. So you have to really think hard, is this who we want to be seen as, uh, as a creator? Um, and I think having a public facing value statement is really important because that holds ourselves accountable to what we feel that we believe. Um, but it's only valuable if that statement is actually followed. <laughs> if we just put up a value statement and then we don't follow it, like one of the clients I'm working with right now, they have a wonderful value statement, but the games that they make do not reflect their values at all. And so I've kind of pointed that out to them and they're kind of like, well, I guess we're going to have to rewrite our values. Um, it's either remake the games or re redo the values. So the last thing I want to mention, though, is about freedom of creativity, because this is very important to me, because we are an art form. We are, we are allowed to make anything we want to make as creators, and that's very important. Um, so you can, you can exercise your creative vision, but you can't expect that vision to, to 
be basically aligned with the expectations in other cultures, like I've illustrated. There's a lot of ways that you will not be aligned with those cultures, and you can't expect to be aligned with everybody because you will not make everyone happy. That's impossible. Um, even if you do the most greatest due diligence on creating a certain character or culture in your game, somebody out there on Twitter is going to say something about it because they got nothing else to do. Um, so a lot of us in the creative position find ourselves torn between these two uh, positions about trying to maximize our self-expression, which is the, the art, kind of the artistic side, you know, sh making the game that I want to make and then maximizing exposure, which typically means you want to get it to as many places around the world as possible. And this is what I call the fulcrum of compromise, because oftentimes it's really hard to do both of these really well. We either strive to be expressive of our vision, or we try and get that vision around the world. And those different versions I talked about kind of align with this. So the pure default version is your pure artistic self-expression versus the more you adapt the content, globalize, you know, culturalize the content, the more you're trying to maximize the exposure and increase its ability to be enjoyed by as many people as possible. There is no right answer here. Neither, neither of these sides are right or wrong. It's just something that we decide as creators to, ch we choose what's more important to us, you know, as individuals and as a company. So the most critical thing then that I think a lot of companies need to embrace around this topic is embrace the moral dilemma, as I call it, because when these issues come up, what I've seen so many times with different clients is they kind of run away from it. It's like, well, no, we're, ju we're just a business. We're just a business. It's like, no, you are, you are creating culture. You are generating a cultural artifact that will be with us for centuries, assuming we don't have a massive blackout or EMP burst, but um, you, this, what you're creating is a, is a contribution to culture, both locally and globally. So it's not just a business. It's not, you know, again, it's like, in, or to say that games are not political, that's ridiculous. It's like games are an expression of culture. And so, um, so I think it's important to proactively address these uh, issues when you're, when you're working on game content that might be a potential problem. Um, you know, so it, it's it's something that we really need to think about and also understand what your moral position might be on your own work. And that might be a series of discussions you need to have. It's discussions between the leadership of the studio and the, and the people working in the studio, you know, under what conditions are you willing to change your creative vision and why? And it's, it's a really hard choice, though. I especially know for small studios or indie studios, you really want to you know, generate that revenue. And I understand that. And so sometimes they tend to kind of move away from their own values just to get the money and to get moving, which you know sometimes it's a really hard decision to make. And you have to decide, do we do that now? And then kind of when once we ha can afford to, we can kind of you know, be more solid with our values or what kind of approach do we take? And it's, it's a complicated problem. Um, so, you know, basically it's that issue, what are you prepared to do for your game's success and at what cost? Especially both the long-term and short-term costs. So that is essentially my topic here. And uh, do we have any questions? Right, thank you. Uh, it was absolutely amazing presentation. Thank, thank you. you. And it's not really a question per se, but uh, maybe I wanted uh, you will elaborate a little bit on the last part. You said that games are very political and you're always creating some sort of a footprint. And I'm not sure what kind of uh, values I share on that point, mm -hmm. but I think uh, the games always were or they served as some way of escapism for many people. And I can say that for me personally, when I play certain games, I don't want to be reminded yeah. about a lot of problems and issues we have in a real world about mm -hmm. racism, about sexism, about political situations and wars. So do we really think this is the way forward for game industry? to really think about how many people we can offend, how many cultural <laughs> groups we can offend, other than concentrate completely on making the game experience desirable for players. That's a, that's a great point you raise. And I think you're right, is that ultimately as creators, our job is to make a game, basically make the game you want to make. 
that's really what your goal should be. You know, whatever whatever the consequences of that might be, um, you ultimately first and foremost need to make the game you want to make, um, no matter what the topic is. And there's no requirement that you have to make sure it's political. That's not what I was saying. Ultimately, I'm saying at some point we should think at a slightly higher level, let's take a step back from our creation and kind of look at it and say, you know, what is my game saying something that I don't want it to say? Or is it implying something I don't want it to say? Um, and is there any way to make sure that that perception doesn't show up? Because some, like some game developers, they absolutely want their game to be political. And other game developers will say, no, that is not my intent at all. Just like there's one game I'm working on right now. In fact, I was just doing it a couple hours ago, uh, uh, responding to my client where they their intention was not to be political at all but the way that they set up the scenario which was kind of this fantasy world that is heavily based on the real world in fact if you look at the game you say well this i know exactly what they're representing here i know who they're representing in the real world so they didn't make a lot of effort to make what i call allegorical distance to make sure that what's in their game is just more fantasy than real um, and because they did not do that, it's really easy for people to read into their game all kinds of political messages, which they said that is not our intention at all, that we did not want to do that. Um, so then they have to basically take a step back and think, well, if that's not our intention, we don't want to make all these political messages, then what might we need to change in our game to make it less obvious? You know, because we just want people to enjoy the game that we created. We don't want them to be thinking about that this group is that particular country or that group is this culture. Um, and so I think it's just what I'm advocating for is, is that you need to make the game you want to make. But at some point, I think it's healthy to kind of take that higher level view and look at it like from other people's eyes. Like, is there a chance that they might perceive something that you don't want them to perceive? And then, then you can decide, well, do I want to change that or not? So that's basically uh, where I'm coming from. Uh, I would have a question, if yeah. I may. It was truly an amazing and a fascinating presentation. I have Thank not you. expected it. Uh, just like a few weeks ago, I learned about like film, how films are adjusted to different audiences. Like yeah. really, like you showed some mm -hmm. stuff of that. But uh, like, I really love the part about the values, and I try to. to I, I find it hard for teams to navigate through it because, like, we are biased by like where we were raised up, mm -hmm. you know, like I don't know, religion, different uh, stuff. So it's not just like let's think about values. I find it like hard. We need to go like really deep, yeah. maybe study up on the history. So do you have like a shortcuts or like tips and tricks how to navigate through these questions i i think that well that's a good point too especially today when i mean we have a lot of teams that are you know even teams that might be regionally based or locally based i mean a lot of us are using remote workers now you know thanks to covid and even before covid so we're a lot of teams i know you know especially even indie teams today they're comprised of multicultural people from all different places and so if you're going to say well, we're going to create a value statement it's like well what is that going to be based on? Because kind of to your point is that ultimately values imply a sense of right and wrong. And those sense of right and wrong, typically for most of us, were shaped for us by our religious background, you know, whether it's Christianity or Islam or something else. And so, because, you know, that sense of right and wrong essentially is established on some kind of foundation that is kind of outside of ourselves. Um, we don't tend to come up with our own perception of what's right and wrong. Um, that's why we have laws, because laws in different countries, the laws are a way of saying we agree as a country, as a collective society, that this is right and this is wrong. Um, and so it's hard because when you're on a team like that, I mean, a lot of times, like uh, there's a couple of clients right now where I've, they've been longtime clients of mine, but they've approached me to help them rewrite their values, which I'm like... I can help you rewrite them, but you have to come up with the values. They're not mine. You know, I'm not going to impose any values on you. Um, but I think part of that is because they feel like they they need like a third, a, a disinterested third party to kind of look over their shoulder and kind of give feedback on whether whether I think these values are maybe biased in a certain direction or another. Um, but it is it's complicated to do. So it, oftentimes they'll start with like you saw. Um, maybe if I go back really quick, there was that uh, slide with the blizzard values on it, which, you know, you see 
these values, they're nice values. I mean, they all sound great. You know, they're very generic, you know, which, and I think pretty much almost any game company would probably choose to have values like this. Um, so, you know, you can come up with more genericized values like this, which I think is a good start because, you know, Blizzard, like many companies, very diverse company, very, you know, comprised of many people from around the world. Um, so it's like, do we have values that most human beings can agree upon? And I think that's a good set. The problem with them, of course, is they didn't reflect their values. They didn't follow them. So, um, so I think that's the bigger thing is that you have to decide what are, what are the basic values going to be, but then how, how do we hold ourselves accountable to that? And that's the hard part. That's the really hard part. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> Uh, if we've got no more questions, Kate, thank you very much for the amazing that we've got. Great. <laughs> Sorry for taking a lot of time. Yeah. Um, you, a lot of, a lot of things you said were mentioned about, uh, censorship in China in particular. And I wonder what do you think, or at what breaking point this will cripple the game development industry so much that you think game developers and game publishers should take some sort of stand and say, well, this is too much. So I, I wondering, like, from your perspective, where is this too much? And where maybe also from game developers and maybe also from the players, like, uh, what is enough or how much it will continue? Or maybe what mm -hmm. do you think is a future? And yeah, that that's a great question. I think you know, honestly, like I mentioned before, that one action by China last year declaring that they didn't want to see like LGBTQ characters and relationships in their games, that really was sort of a watershed moment, I think, for a lot of game companies because the majority of game companies, at least the larger like AAA studios, are all committed to inclusion. That that is the way forward. They all want to make sure that they're, you know, the character creation systems are incredibly inclusive. They're incredibly diverse, um, you know, and, and not just the character creation, but then the characters you meet in the game. Like for example, I've worked on all the Bioware games since Jade Empire. I'm working on Dragon Age Four right now, and the creative choices being made around this issue are great. I mean, they're incredibly inclusive. And um, so it's basically, you'll be able to go in and play any kind of character you could possibly imagine. And so it's maximizing that flexibility. So anyone playing the game can feel comfortable playing the game as themselves or any other kind of person they want to be. And that flies directly against like what China's declared. And so, but then at the same time, you know, Bioware, like in a meeting we had a few months ago, I kind of raised that point and I said, by the way, by doing this action that we're about to do in the game, um, this makes this game completely, un, you know, inaccessible to China, you know, and then one of the people on the team basically said the response was fuck China. That's it. So I was like, okay, well now I, now I know. So now basically that's an expression of value saying that, you know, but that, that also is consistent with Bioware. They've always been very open with their values, especially about inclusivity. Cause like that during that Mass Effect uh, episode that I mentioned earlier, there were some people like in the US, for example, on Twitter saying, well, we don't want to, I don't want to see that in a game. I don't need to see a lesbian kiss in the game. You know, and, and the, one of the creative directors at the time went on the, the Bioware blog and basically said, if you don't like it, then don't play our game because that's, that's what we want to represent in our game. We're representing reality. And if you don't like it, then don't play it. We don't care. And that was, that was pretty straightforward, you know, but then again, the other thing is that companies like Blizzard or companies like Bioware, they're in a position to be able to say that because they've had so much success, they can afford to kind of be a little more free with their values like that. Um, some companies, especially smaller companies have a of a bigger challenge because you know you're trying to make more people happy because you want people to play your game so you can build up a player base and a fan base and you know have a future so it's challenging so i don't know what the exact way forward is but i would love to see the industry be more forceful and, and have more of a singular voice on this it's one of the reasons why I ran the International Game Developers Association, because I feel very passionately about these issues, and especially about us being collective in our in our response to this. Um, in the same way, the industry has shown a pretty strong collective response to what Russia did a few months ago and what they're continuing to do. This, what China's been doing has been going on, but more quietly for the last decade. And because I think it's been a slow burn, 
and it hasn't really had like these punctuated moments of conflict. That's why we have not seen that kind of response. But we're starting to see signs of it. Like I mentioned, the Top Gun example and a few other examples recently where we've seen content um, in China, basically companies standing up and saying, you know what, forget it. We're not going to do it. And, um, you know, Quentin Tarantino did that too with his film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, is that China requested that the scene with Bruce Lee be taken out. And he said, no. He's like, that's part of my film. I'm not taking it out. So that film didn't release. And again, he's someone in a position who can easily say that because he's had so much success. But the more we see people do that, I think the more it fuels the argument that it's okay not to do that. We don't have to basically do what China wants anymore. So, and I think it's important. I think it's important for companies to not only make the decision, but be vocal about the decision and let people know that this, we made this decision for a reason. Hey, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so we're talking all this inclusivity, which is great in my opinion, and we're talking like companies do want to be inclusive, but mm -hmm. I'm not so sure because let's let's check the last clash bag of, of almost gaming gate era of last of us two. Like uh, how how uh, and it wasn't even like so inclusive. It was just they decided to to just change the story a bit or, or make some story more more interesting more more adventurous and and when we saw the clash back of reviews and and gamers and community as a whole so are, are we sure that this is the this is the way companies will go in terms of increasing inclusivity yes I think so. I, I, I do because it's ultimately in this industry, because it's an industry, which means it's a business, which means it's out to make money. <laughs> ultimately, what they realize is that the more inclusive you are, the more revenue you can potentially get because you're attracting customers that are from different segments of the population, not just one segment. And so, for example, there's games that I've worked on where they are making adaptations to like some of the character representations because they realize that in a lot of markets, women make up at least 40% of the game players, but then they're making content that is, that is basically intended to appeal primarily to male players. So they're saying, well, wait a minute, why are we leaving out 40% of the player segment? That's a lot of money that we're leaving on the table. So why don't we do some, a little more activity to make our games more inclusive, to add features, to add character designs uh, that may not be so blatantly sexist, for example, and then we maybe we can attract more female players to our game. And so there's been companies that have been successful at that approach because they realize, you know, it's just a lot of times it's very surgical minor changes. It's not like changing the entire story or the entire world. It's just adding little tweaks here and there. You know, even like, for example, with Halo multiplayer, which I play a lot of, um, <laughs> because I worked on the originals way back when, but um, I think it was in Halo 4 or Halo Reach, one of those two, the multiplayer added, when you're in multiplayer mode, you can actually select your gender. Now, does it change much of anything? No, because it's you're in Mjolnir armor. You can hardly tell there's a difference. There's a very minor difference. You to flip the toggle you know, between male and female, but ultimately you're still just this big hulking human in armor but what they were the reason they did that though is because they recognized that there's a huge segment of women who play halo multiplayer and it's basically they wanted to make sure that they felt included in the experience by doing that so and it's just that that was a very surgical small change but it had a very positive response because play you know women players in that community said wow they actually notice i'm here so i'll keep i'll stay here Okay, I understand, but how do we explain this this outburst of rage and and this clashback of of this weird community? You mean like gamer gators? Yeah. <laughs> well, I know them very well because they attacked me for over two years straight when I was running the IGDA with death threats and harassment every day. So I'm very familiar with them. So basically, what I feel needs to be done, just like I told the CEOs of many studios at the time during Gamergate, is that you need to stand up and basically express your values as a company, that you value inclusivity. And, and we actually saw out of that time, that is why Microsoft has like the, uh, um, the gaming for everyone 
uh, initiative that they launched during Gamergate. And like EA has positive play, which is basically our games are a positive space for playing for anybody. And so that's why companies launch these initiatives because they wanted to emphasize that our games are for everybody. They're not just for a certain segment. And, you know, so they're, they're trying to do that more and more to, to show that emphasis. But it's, it's hard because social media is what it is. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Kate, thank you very much for your talk. If you've got more questions, feel free to find Kate yes. and discuss more. Uh, this was really amazing. And uh, we'll continue with the uh, next talk about how you can create a well-performing uh, App Store uh, page that attracts a lot of organic traffic.